Hello, I'm Beth O'Sullivan, and I'm on the faculty at Rice University's Jones Graduate School of Business, and also in the School of Engineering as part of the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. Welcome. Today, I'll be giving you some tips for socializing and networking in the United States, even if you consider yourself a shy person. I'll start by defining networking and give you some reasons you might want to try it. Then, we'll talk about preparing to attend a networking event, meeting people and having a conversation with them at an event, and then I'll give you some ideas on how you can continue to build and maintain relationships over time. Let's get started. So what is networking? Well, we are not talking about computer networking, which means to link together different computers so they can share information. Today, we're talking about social networking. According to Investopedia, quote, networking is the exchange of information and ideas among people with a common profession or special interest, usually in an informal social setting. Networking often begins with a single point of common ground, close quote. Hmm, what does common ground mean? Well, if you are in a room with someone, you have at least something in common. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Networking is a great way to meet new people and make new friends. I personally feel that meeting new people is really rewarding. I never know who I'm going to meet when I go to an event. But you might have guessed that I'm fairly outgoing. If you are too, then great. But what if you are more of a shy person? Well, that's okay. Between 40 and 60% of Americans say they are too. So why would you want to network, especially if you're shy? Well, because people who network also have an easier time finding a job. And believe it or not, you may be able to help someone else over time too. Let's talk more about that. As I said, meeting new people with common interests can really be helpful in finding a job because studies show that people get jobs from someone known to someone they know. So not necessarily a first connection, but usually a second or a third connection. There are usually lots of people applying for a specific job. If you see a job posted on a website, go ahead and apply. But then contact someone you know who works at that company to learn more about the job and see if they know anyone who works in that department. Your goal here is to increase chances that your resume will be seen among the many other applicants online. Being seen is the first part of being considered for your job. I personally might be hesitant to ask a friend to recommend me for a job, but I would tell them how interested I am, and I might even ask if they felt comfortable mentioning my interest to someone in the department where I had applied. It's all about being seen. And having a large network of contacts can help you be seen. There is a drawback though. Over time, networking has gotten a bad image because some people do it just to use other people and not for the really right reasons. So let's reframe your attitude towards networking. When you think about your network, you might think of three different groups of people that all intersect with you. First, your personal network or group of contacts. Who's that? Well, it's personal friends and family, classmates, maybe Facebook or Instagram friends. Next, you have your community network. There you have family friends, members of clubs or social groups, teachers, maybe those in your faith community. And then finally, you have your business or professional network, and that has coworkers, colleagues, and possibly even future employers in it. You can expand all these three circles. Over time, you'll develop meaningful relationships. And the big picture here is about links between all these groups. Yes, someone might help you get a job, but think also about how knowing all these cool people can help you give back to them. Maybe you just met someone starting a new company and she's looking for someone who knows how to code in Python. And you just happen to know someone who's a great coder who's looking for some part-time work. You can put them together. Believe it or not, over the span of your life, you will give back far more times than you ever ask for help. So yes, networking can help you when you need it, but keep the bigger idea in mind. Knowing lots of people allows you to help others. It's this opportunity to give back that really makes networking rewarding. To me, your first and most important goal should be to develop relationships. Meeting new friends and learning about new ideas and points of view is really fun. And that starts with meeting people. 
Where can you meet people? Everywhere. Now that COVID restrictions have been lifted, we can meet in person again. Yeah, it may seem strange at first, but give it a try. And remember that your main goal is to develop new relationships, but not self-centered or superficial ones. Be sincerely interested in having a conversation and learning about the other person. So how do you get started? First, be aware of your situation. You can meet people anywhere, from socializing with friends all the way up to a formal company function or a formal job search. This slide shows some places where you might meet some people. It helps if you do some preparation before going to an event where you might be meeting new people. Now that we've talked about what networking is and why you might want to try it, let's talk about what you can do before you attend an event to be sure you're comfortable, even if you are a kind of shy person. Remember that we said to be aware of the situation. A networking event is meant to let you meet new people and make connections. Your ultimate purposes might be to get an internship, but not tonight. <laughs> For tonight, decide why you are going and set some reasonable goals. Maybe you want to meet new people, or you might have a more specific goal, such as to learn more about opportunities for people with your skills in the energy field. When I say to set some goals, make them reasonable goals. Don't expect yourself to go meet 50 people. Go to the party and meet one or two people, and if you're shy, go home after that. Set yourself up for small successes. The next time you go to a party, maybe you'll meet three people, and then maybe four. Remember that the idea is to have a short, and that means about five minutes, and meaningful conversation with a few people. To help you get ready, do some internet research on the companies and people who will be attending the event. If it's a RICE event, you can go online and see which companies have been invited. If you learn more about a company from its website, you'll have some interesting questions to ask someone who works there if you meet them. Next, be sure to dress appropriately. Business attire is usually expected at a networking event. If you have any questions about that, ask someone from your program office about what to wear. It's a good idea to have business cards made with your name, program, and contact information. Ask your program coordinator how you can order business cards with the RICE logo on them. Next, prepare a self-introduction, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. You'll need both a short version and a longer version, which would be appropriate for different events. Before you go to an event, it's important to name and face your fears. One possible concern you might have is fear of strangers. Did you know that attending a party with strangers is the number one social fear, according to the New York Times? People are more afraid of this than they are afraid of speaking in public. And some people are more afraid of that than they are of dying. You know, your mother probably told you, don't talk to strangers. That was good advice then. But as an adult, you have the judgment to override your mom. Use your own instincts. One solution to this roadblock is to redefine the term stranger. It's just a friend you haven't met yet. People are different in wonderful ways. Gender, race, age, region of the country or world, professional background. So go and meet someone new. People at Rice aren't really strangers. Many are students, teachers, staff, or alumni, and they have a history with the school. They're likely to be pretty friendly. Well, the next fear is rejection, and yes, it could happen to you that you get rejected. But be willing to take a risk. And if you are rejected, just go and meet someone else. It's their loss not to have met you. Finally, people are sometimes reluctant to start talking to someone unless they have been introduced. And there are two possible solutions to overcoming this concern. The first is to behave as if you are the host of the party. When you host a party, what do you do? Well, you make others feel comfortable. You might offer them food or a beverage, and you might introduce them to other people at the party. At Rice, you really are a host, so it's okay to behave that way. Next, it helps to have a good self-introduction planned. Since we're not meeting in person, we can't do this exercise in class, but here's an assignment for later to help you develop and practice your self-introduction. Ask a friend or new colleague to practice with you. Pretend that you're attending a reception after a speech at Rice. People there will be students, alumni, company representatives, etc greet one another and shake hands, and then deliver a brief self-introduction. After saying hello, speak your first and last name slowly. 
pause in between your two names so the two names don't run together. If your name is hard to pronounce, offer help. One graduate student I knew whose name was Ansari told people to think of an orange tree. After you say your name, add a short comment that gives the other person more information about you or a way to respond and start a conversation. For example, I might say, hi, I'm Beth O'Sullivan. I'm on the faculty here at Rice. Or, hi, I'm Beth O'Sullivan. I really enjoyed the speech tonight. What did you think? One other thing to do to prepare for an event is to be sure you have a great American style handshake. Thank goodness that COVID restrictions have been lifted and we can meet in person again this year. The handshake is back. So here are some tips. If you are seated, stand up to meet and shake hands with someone. Look at your hand to find the space between your thumb and your index finger. That is called the web of your hand. Make sure that you are stepping close enough to the other person to shake hands web to web. If you don't, you might end up squeezing someone's rings or not feeling like you got a good handshake. Be sure to make eye contact and smile. Now, for some reason, some women tend to tilt their heads when shaking hands. I don't know why, but that's not needed. And I've also observed that some men tend to twist their hands as if arm wrestling. Just keep your head straight and your hand vertical. In many countries, a soft handshake is a sign of respect, but in the United States, a firm handshake is expected. Not bone crushing and painful, but not soft or limp either. Try to match the pressure you're feeling. You've probably noticed the source notes on the bottom of some of these slides. There's a wonderful book called How to Work a Room by Suzanne Rowan. And she says that one way to be more comfortable at a party is to join the greeting committee. It makes you one of the hosts. If you arrive five to 10 minutes early, you can familiarize yourself with the room. And of course, you'll be there on hand to greet new people when they come in. We suggest wearing your name tag on your right lapel. It is at the top of the handshake and it makes it easy for people to see your name tag. If you're looking around for someone to talk with, you usually would not join a group of two people since they might be having a private conversation. But when three or more people are gathered together, you can approach a group, stand on the periphery, listen, smile, and nod, and with any luck, one of them will make eye contact and invite you into the conversation and introduce you to the others. Similarly, when you're talking in a group of two or three or four people, be open to noticing when other people are on the edge and invite them to join your conversational group. Make it easy for them. It's part of being a good host. Introduce people to each other with a connection. Please meet my friend Amir. He's a second year student in aerospace engineering. If you say more than just a name and give that person some more information about your friend, it gives the person something to follow up with rather than just giving him a name without a connection. Now that you've met a few people, what are you going to talk about? Deborah Fine, author of the book, The Fine Art of Small Talk, says to give the gift of your name and a connection. If you're in a room with someone, they most likely have some common connection with you. A wedding is a good example because we know what to say. Hi, I'm Beth and I'm friends with the bride. Are you friends with the bride or the groom? Think about how that same idea could extend to a short greeting or opening of a conversation that you might use at a neighborhood gathering or a professional society meeting. Identifying the common interest you have can form the basis for your initial conversation. Back to Suzanne Rowan's book, she offers a strategy called OR, offer an observation, ask a question, and reveal your views. For example, you can offer an observation, hey, the food looks great or you can ask a question. Now be careful here because you want to ask an open-ended question. An open-ended question has the potential to generate more conversation. A closed-ended question usually has a yes or no answer and is not going to elicit a lot more conversation. So ask an open-ended question and then continue the conversation by developing other people's comments or providing some different views. Finally, you can reveal your thoughts, ideas, or opinions if appropriate, but you don't want to start a big fight. After all, this is a party. Take a minute to read these sample open-ended questions, which you might ask at a networking event. What's the difference between the first ones that are in black and the last two that are in blue text? Well, the last two are more personal. This final one is handy for someone you have met before. You can ask, what's been going on in your life since I last saw you? 
it's not a good idea to ask, how's your wife? What if they're divorced? So this last question is a really useful one. One last tip. Remember that your job at a networking event is to meet people, not to eat. You can eat, but choose the food you can easily manage. I don't even know why they serve those little round red tomatoes that roll off people's plates at networking events. And remember, red wine can stain easily. Once you're into a conversation at a party, keep up your part. If someone says, what's been going on? Don't say, not much. Instead, say something. Perhaps, we're planning a visit to the Texas Hill Country next weekend, or we had a great soccer game last weekend. Here's some things that are easy to talk about in the United States. Local events, culture, hobbies, business, etc. You can always talk about the event, the location, or the food. And here in the United States, people really do like to talk about themselves. One thing that works for me is to say, hey, that sounds interesting. How did you get involved in that? Or sometimes I just say, cool, tell me more. You need to be a well-read, well-rounded person to be a good conversationalist. Read things outside of your academic discipline. Have new ideas and new perspectives so you can contribute to conversations and respond to the ideas of others. To carry on a conversation, you need to link ideas together. Ask something such as, what do you think? Or, I hadn't thought about it that way. Or, how did you come to have that perspective? How did you get interested in that? But avoid rapid fire questions. You are not interrogating your new friend. Instead, ask open-ended questions and allow for answers that let you learn more about the other person. Offer your own observations and be willing to be a little vulnerable. Finally, Letitia Baldridge, one of the great authors of etiquette books here in the United States, says this, be bright, be brief, be gone. But how do you leave a conversation gracefully? One way is to ask the person to join you in another group. You might say, oh, I see my friend Nassim. Can I introduce you? Once they're engaged in a conversation, you can easily say, excuse me. Another way is to return the conversation to the first topic. You might say, I've so enjoyed talking with you about the changes in healthcare. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Or you can ask for a business card if that seems appropriate possibly as a route to issuing an invitation. You might say, I know there are so many others who want to visit with you this evening. May I ask for a business card? I'd like to stay in touch and maybe we could go to have coffee and continue our conversation. Now here's a side note. In the United States, someone saying, let's have lunch or let's have coffee might not mean that. If you reach out to set up something and they don't respond, try again. But after two attempts, it probably means they don't have time to meet you. So don't feel offended. People are really just busy. Back to ending conversations. You can ask for a referral. I'm really interested in the marketing aspects of the new software division. Is there someone you suggest I talk with? If that person is attending the party, maybe you can be introduced. Finally, you can end a conversation by showing appreciation. You might say, thank you so much for coming to Rice. We appreciate your support so much. Have a wonderful evening. Or you can make your intentions clear by saying things like, it's been so nice to meet you. I'm going to circulate and meet some of the other new students. Or, thanks for chatting with me. I want to get around to say hi to everyone, but I hope you have a great evening. Congratulations, you had a great time at this party. How do you build your network over time? Well, when you get home, write down some notes on who you met at the event and what you talked about. Consider sending a follow-up email saying you enjoyed meeting him or her. Over time, look for ways to give back. You might find articles that might be of interest to your new contacts and send them. But do not say anything about a job. Your goal here is to network for relationships first. When you are ready in a year or so, that might be the time to see which of your contacts might know someone who could help you get a job. But in the meantime, be ready to give back by connecting your contacts to your other contacts when appropriate. Don't put two people together unless one has the skills the other really needs and that you're confident that connecting them to each other will benefit them both. Finally, use social media appropriately to extend and maintain your network. It's a great idea to take the Career Center's workshop on LinkedIn to make sure your profile is as strong as you are. 
I hope after this session, you'll feel more comfortable getting ready to socialize and network in the United States. Once you're finally on campus, we'll hold additional graduate continuing orientation sessions and may be able to have some practice sessions. But take some time to practice at home, practice a self-introduction, and then be ready to come and meet new people in the United States. You might be surprised how fun it is to meet new people and learn new ideas. And be sure to share your culture too. That's part of what makes you such a special part of Rice University. The next two slides offer some additional resources and books you can read about socializing and networking in the United States. Have fun and good luck at Rice. Bye.